let's say that I have a signal. I'm gonna draw this particular signal to be sinusoidal in nature, although that doesn't necessarily have to be true. And this signal, X of T, could represent a voltage, a current, or power. And I feed that signal into a black box network where X of T is my input. Oops and I observe an output signal, Y of T. Um, so let's call this guy here a black box network. And my observed output signal, Y of T, might look something like this. where this output signal could represent a voltage, a current, or a power as well. There are two different things, devices, networks, whatever you want to call them, that can make this signal processing happen, okay? Because that's exactly what we're doing here. We are applying some sort of input signal with the goal of getting some sort of output signal, all right? So there are two ways that we can do this. Number one is by using an amplifier. And number two, very specifically for sinusoidal signals, would be to use what's called a transformer, okay? Amplifiers are what we are going to be focused on in this class for the next week and a half or so. Really kind of up until the, the, the Christmas break. Transformers are what you were gonna start talking about in circuits three, all right? There are some fundamental differences between these two different things. Um, and that is going to influence the way that we talk about, okay? So one of the main bits uh, or, or differences between these two things is that an amplifier is an active device and a transformer is a passive, go away email. So we talked very briefly about active and passive devices in circuits one. Does anybody remember what the difference between these two things is? When I say briefly, I probably mentioned it for less than 10 seconds. So it's totally okay if you don't remember. Anybody have any thoughts? I think you have to have an external power source and use things other than inductors or Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I would say you could leave off the last bit and just say active devices require external power. Passive devices do not. Um, that being said, the components that you mentioned, resistors, capacitors, and inductors are great examples of passive devices because 
they exhibit their current voltage characteristic regardless of whether or not you have a signal applied to them. So a resistor is resistive regardless of whether or not you have it connected to a circuit or anything. Sim uh, similarly, an inductor exhibits inductance even when it is not connected to a circuit. But an op amp does not behave like an amplifier unless you power it, okay? A transformer is a passive device. It is capable of boosting or bucking, uh, so uh, boosting or attenuating signals uh, without any external power being applied. Now, one very interesting thing about the fact that one requires external power and the other one does not is that for an amplifier, the output power of our signal P out does not have to equal the input power of our signal, okay? And it's because we are supplying external power to cause that boost or attenuation to occur. Whereas in a transformer, the output power must be less than or equal to the input power for our signal. Um, if the output power is exactly equal to the input power, we have what's called an ideal transformer because all of the power or energy on the primary coil is being transferred to the secondary coil. Uh, but in the overall, well, not in the, in, in real cases, um, there will be some losses because these things are made of wires and stuff like that, which um, dissipate energy in the form of heat. So we have losses associated and you should see that the output power is going to be very slightly less than the input power. Most electrical transformers operate at a very, very high efficiency. So now that we know the two different ways that we can handle simple analog signal processing, as it were, let's limit our focus specifically to amplifiers. So by definition, an amplifier is an electrical circuit or device which increases the magnitude of the signal applied at its input. So if we have a black box amplifier circuit. where the input signal is X of T and the output signal is Y of T, our relationship between our input and output will be simply Y of T is equal to A times x of t, where a here is what is known as the gain of the amplifier if it's a 
DC amplifier. And it can be thought of as the transfer function of the amplifier if it is an AC amplifier. So our gain A is simply the ratio. Sorry, that should be of T. over x of t. What we dealt with back in circuits one, what we're going to be dealing with in a little bit in this class, was what's called a voltage amplifier because our input signal was a voltage quantity and our output signal was a voltage quantity. So we were dealing with voltage gain. I should know I'm in class. Um, but there are other types of amplifiers that we will deal with, just not necessarily in this class. In fact, um, literally one year from now, uh, I hope the overwhelming majority of you will be dealing with me again in uh, Analog Electronics 1, ELEN 335, where in that class, we start dealing with transistor amplifiers. Um, and transistor amplifiers, depending on how things are connected, can be voltage amplifiers, current amplifiers, trans-resistance amplifiers, trans-conductance amplifiers, power amplifiers, the full gamut of things. For this class, we're gonna focus only on the voltage amplifier bit. So, just as a very quick table, the types of amplifiers that we are gonna be dealing with as electrical engineers can be broadly classified as follows. So let's say we have our input signal, X of T. That's not how you spell output. Y of T, and over here will be amplifier. So if our input signal is a voltage and our output signal is a voltage, we very unimaginatively call this a voltage amplifier. Similarly, if our input signal is a current and our output signal is a current, we have a current amplifier. If our input signal is a voltage and our output signal is a current, we have a transconductance amplifier. And if our input signal is a current, our output signal is a voltage we have a trans resistance amplifier. And then finally, if our input is power and our output is power, we have a power amplifier. So before we move along to getting into the meat and potatoes of analysis, um, Let's talk about a couple of these different amplifiers. Um, I don't know if I talked uh, a lot about this in circuits one, but I generally speaking in all my EE classes talk about how much of an absolute nerd I am for rock and roll and metal music and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I love guitars. I love amplifiers. I have a couple of guitars in my office. I have three more at home. I'm hoping to buy at least one more over the Christmas break. Uh, depending on how much attention my wife is paying to my checking account, we'll see. Uh, but anyway, I love guitars and amplifiers and all that kind of good stuff. And in my spare time, uh, I design effects pedals and crap like that. So the effects pedals and the pre-amplifiers uh, for, you know, a, a nice Marshall stack or whatever, those are examples of voltage amplifiers where you're taking an input signal, 
which is a voltage that is induced um, by the vibration of the guitar's strings. And it takes that very small voltage, typically on the order of tens of millivolts, and converts it to a line level signal, which means nothing more than a voltage somewhere on the order of one volt in magnitude. It's AC and has lots of frequency characteristics depending on you know, where on the guitar's neck you're playing and all that kind of good stuff. Now, the output of that voltage amplifier is chained into the input of a power amplifier. And the power amplifier is the bit that actually makes the speakers move, right? The reason why a power amplifier is necessary, even for something like, how many of you guys have AirPods or something like that? Headphones, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Those guys absolutely have a preamp that is a voltage amplifier and a second stage, which is a power amplifier that moves the speaker. And the reason for that is you have to think about the physical amount of mass that you need to move to generate a pressure wave, because that's all that a speaker does, is it moves this cone back and forth. And that cone for a, a large guitar cabinet or something like that has a big ass magnet on it that weighs literally a couple of pounds. And you're using a voltage signal and the concept of electromagnetic induction to move that magnet back and forth. Well, a small voltage signal, typically speaking, doesn't carry enough power to make that happen. So you use a power amplifier stage to boost the power of the signal to make it cause that mass to move and generate the sound that you're looking for. I can't tell you how many times I've had senior design students make a very simple voltage audio amplifier and then try to connect it to a speaker and never understand why it is never louder than a whisper, regardless of how much they turn up the volume. And it's because the signal that they're generating doesn't have the power to drive a speaker because they didn't include a power amp stage. Okay, so anyway, uh, all of that to say, at least some of things, some of these things are stuff that we deal with on a daily basis. If you listen to the radio when you drive your car to school or work or whatever, you're dealing with voltage and power. Absolutely. If you use a cell phone, you're dealing with current amplifiers and transconductance amplifiers because you've got transistor amplifiers all over uh, your cell phone and stuff like that. So we use these literally everywhere and every day. All right. So let's consider a simple voltage amplifier circuit, all right? We're gonna be dealing with our black box for just a little bit more. All right, our input signal, let's call it Vn of t because it's a voltage amplifier. And our output signal, let's call it V out of t. So what I want to do now, is just kind of break things up. So let's say that we are supplying our input signal by a practical voltage source that has some internal resistance, RS. And we have some source signal, VS, as a function of time. And the output of our amplifier circuit is driving the load resistance RL so that we have 
some voltage drop across our load, VL of T. We can break this system down into three discrete parts. On the left-hand side, we have our source. In the middle, we have our amplifier. And on the right-hand side, we have our load. So, let me ask you guys a bit of an open-ended question. What is the ideal behavior of this circuit? Yeah, that's fair. So, so what do you mean by that? Um, I don't, I don't want to go that far. So we are not applying directly this quantity V N of T to the input of the amplifier, right? We have control over V S. And we don't get to measure the output directly. I mean, we kind of do because this is an open circuit in parallel with a resistor or whatever. So it's going to look like this resistor. But so we as end users control Vs of T and observe VL of T. Because this is an amplifier circuit, ideally, VL of T will just be a scaled version of the S of T because that's the purpose of this thing, right? We want it to be the same signal, but bigger. So ideally, the S of T will be approximately, excuse me, the L of T erase. A, our amplifiers gain, or I'm going to call it AV specifically, where AV, which is the voltage gain of the amplifier, is V out divided by V in. So VL is AV multiplied by VS of T. So that is ideally what we want to happen. I'd like to take a minute here to look at the circuit schematic diagram for a very commonly used op amp. And for those of you that were in my 220 class, we've seen this before. Let me scroll down about, I think, eight pages. Nope. There we go. And let's make this a little smaller. And a little smaller still so that it will all fit on one page. All right. This schematic diagram is a simplified version of a Texas Instruments mu A741 op amp. 741 was one of the first op amps as an integrated circuit that was ever designed, okay? This simplified version contains 22 transistors, 11 resistors, one diode, and a capacitor. That's a, simplified that's a simplified version, yes. We are nowhere near the level of expertise needed to analyze this circuit. I teach a class on integrated circuit design for seniors, and I would be hard pressed to analyze this thing without breaking it down into easily digestible little blocks of stuff that I understand what that part does and then try to figure out how it's all connected, okay? So if this is what 
a simple amplifier looks like. What the hell are we doing covering amplifiers in your first real circuits class? Well, the internal workings of this guy is very difficult to understand, but we really only care about big picture, how it works. And we can quantify that with just a couple of simple parameters, okay? So, you guys remember Tavin and Norton equivalent circuits, right? Certainly hope so. Okay, so if I disconnected my source and looked in, what do you think I would see? So I have a dead network because I have no supply voltage anymore. So what's my expectation? A resistance. That resistance would represent the internal or input resistance of the op amp. Okay, so I'm gonna draw something here. Let's call that guy Rn. Over here, we have Rs. This is Vs of T. This is Vn of T. And then on the other side, where I have my load and all that kind of stuff. Let's draw that guy, RL. Actually, RL should be on the other side. Come on, stylus, do your job. There we go. So going back to this guy up top, if I disconnected, my load resistance and looked in through those open circuit terminals, what should I see this time? I don't have a dead network anymore because my source voltage is applied. So I'm either going to see a Norton equivalent circuit or a Thevenin equivalent circuit, right? So a voltage source in series with a resistor or a current source in parallel with a resistor. I'm gonna choose the Thevenin equivalent representation. So I'm going to see some resistance that I'm going to call R out. And I am choosing to use a dependent source here instead of an independent source. And the reason why I'm choosing to use a dependent source here is because I know that my output voltage should be a scaled version of my input voltage. And so I'm going to force that dependency by using a dependent source. So I'm gonna call this guy here in the middle, AV times Vn of t. This simplified model that we've just developed using nothing more than really the idea of a seven and equivalent circuit is what is known as the practical amplifier model, okay? Where our amplifier is characterized by three components. Uh, three values uh, would be a better way to say it. Our input resistance are in, 
our output resistance R out and our voltage gain AV. And we could create similar practical models for the other different types of amplifiers. And they'd be characterized by the exact same things, except that our gain here wouldn't be a voltage gain anymore. It would be a current gain or a trans resistance gain or a trans conductance gain or a power gain, depending on what type of amplifier we have. But it would look exactly like this. For some things, it would be easier to make this into a practical current source. Others, it's easier to represent it with a practical voltage source. But we'll get into all of that crap when we deal with transistor amplifier circuits in about one year's time. So, this is a very, very good model representation of the overwhelming majority of amplifier circuits, but it has one or voltage circuits. Um, and it can represent what all of that internal circuitry does from a big picture view of inputs and outputs, right? Where we don't really care what's happening with the quiescent operating point of transistor Q7. We just want to know if we put in this input signal, what do we get at the output? Okay. The problem with this model is that it doesn't quite match up with what we expect for an op amp. And the reason is because an op amp is what's called a differential amplifier. And so what that means is it has two inputs, right? We saw in engineering 221 that we had a non-inverting input and an inverting input. So we need to modify our practical model very slightly to accommodate an op amp by giving it two inputs. So we'll do that down here, all right? So our practical op amp model is going to look like this. This voltage here, V plus, is representative of the non-inverting input voltage. Here is our resistance Rn. Here is our voltage V minus, where V minus is the inverting input voltage. Whatever we connect to it, we consider to be the inverting input voltage. And the potential difference across this resistor Rn is then simply V plus minus V minus, which we're gonna call Vd where VD stands for a differential voltage, okay? I wanna be very clear about this because sometimes to make things slightly easier, I might draw the inverting input terminal on top and the non-inverting input terminal on bottom. That does not change our definition for VD. Our differential voltage is always, always, always the voltage present at the non-inverting input terminal minus the voltage present at our inverting input terminal. Okay. Now, that's our input side of things. For the output side, it's gonna look something like this. This is AVOL. So that is the open loop voltage gain, right? So the AV bit means voltage gain, and the OL stands for open loop. And we're going to talk about what open loop and closed loop and all that kind of stuff means in a little bit. Our open loop voltage gain is multiplied by our differential voltage VD, 
and then up here, we have our resistance R out. This is our output voltage, V out. And we talked about this briefly in 221, but I want to hammer it home again here. These voltages, V out, G plus, and V minus are all measured with respect to ground. Okay, so these are all nodal voltages. So this is the circuit that for the time being, Brandon, what's up? Um, so it might be an obvious question, but from 221, we run the ideal offhand circuit. Right, so for an ideal op amp circuit, uh, VD would be zero. Yeah, 100%. For a practical op amp, absolutely. So for, for what we are doing until we get to negative feedback circuits, throw away what we learned about op amps. The reason for that is those rules very specifically apply to negative feedback circuits. And we aren't dealing with negative feedback circuits yet. We're gonna start on, let's say today is Friday, Monday, we're gonna go into open loop applications of op amp circuits, which are not negative feedback. Next Wednesday, we're gonna talk about positive feedback op amp circuits, which by definition are not negative feedback. And then finally, next Friday, we will introduce negative feedback circuits and derive where those ideal op amp rules come from and explain how and why they so closely match the behavior of an actual practical op amp. So why we get to treat real op amp circuits that we can go build or negative feedback op amp circuits that we can go build in the lab, why we can get a very good estimation of how they're going to behave by using the ideal op amp rules. But because we're not specifically dealing with negative feedback op amp circuits, the ideal op amp rules mean nothing to us at this point. Does that make sense? Okay. So we are gonna use this big ugly thing here to represent this guy. the time being. So this is actually a very good model for an op amp, but it does have one very, very significant limitation, specifically for DC circuits. It has multiple limitations if we wanted to get into like high free, like radio frequency circuits and all that kind of good stuff, but we're not anywhere close to knowing how the hell to deal with that. Okay. So let's say, let me go to another page, yeah. We're gonna work an example. So let's say that we have the following circuit. 
All right. And I've been, I have explicitly drawn our power supply voltages here as well, because those are going to become very important in just a moment. Okay. Let's say that this amplifier has the following parameters an open loop gain of AVOL is equal to 100,000 volts per volt. Another way to express this would be 100 decibels. That's a very commonly used unit for gain, where by definition, uh, let, me, let me give this to you guys real quick because I do ask you to do something with it in your homework. The voltage gain in decibels is equal to 20 log of the voltage gain not in decibels. So what that means is that if we have a voltage gain of one, that's zero dB. A voltage gain of 10 is 20 dB. A voltage gain of 100 is 40 dB. A voltage gain of 1,000 is 60 dB, and so on and so on. So that's how I can easily see that 10 to the 5 is 100 decibels because it's just 5 times 20. Pardon? Pardon? Uh, exactly right. So if uh, the, the gain in decibels is ever negative, that means instead of amplifying the signal, you are attenuating it. So negative 20 dB means it's 10 times smaller than unity gain. Negative 40 dB is 100 times smaller, etc. Absolutely right. So, sorry, let's say that our input resistance Rn is 1 mega ohm and our output resistance R out is 25 ohms. These values for voltage gain somewhere in the ballpark of 100,000 is actually pretty reasonable. Small for some actual op amp circuits, okay? Um, the, the 741, the general purpose op amp that when I was an undergraduate student, we talked about so much, I didn't realize there were other op amps um, has an open loop voltage gain typically of 200,000. Um, but you can get op amps with voltage gains as low as a couple of thousand and as high as a few million, just depending on how they're designed. This input resistance of one mega ohm is also typical of a 741. The input resistance of an op amp depends on the transistor technology that is used. So for a bipolar junction transistor based op amp, typically on the order of single digit mega ohms. So 10 to the six ohms, somewhere around there. And for uh, field effect transistor based op amps, that value is somewhere on the order of tera ohms or uh, 10 to the 12 ohms. So effectively, almost purely insulated. The amount of current that would flow if you were able to force it is incredibly small. This output resistance of 25 ohms is also pretty in line with a general purpose op amp. You could see it as low as a couple of milli ohms, as high as 100 ohms, anything past that, and you, your amplifier isn't really doing its job right anymore. So these are all kind of just middle of the road values, all right, depending on the technology. So what I want us to do is simply use our practical op amp model and calculate V out for this circuit and see if something feels wrong uh, because it should, all right? So I'm gonna start by drawing my practical op amp model first and then I'll worry about connecting everything else to that. So this is my non-inverting input terminal. Here's my inverting input terminal. So this guy right here is one mega ohm. This voltage drop is VD. 
this guy right here is 25 ohms. And so this is gonna look like 10 to the five multiplied by VD. Here's my output voltage V out. Here is ground. So that's my practical op amp model, right? There's nothing connected at my output. So I'm gonna leave this guy as an open circuit. Everything is okay there, right? Uh, my inverting input terminal is connected to ground. So I connect my inverting input terminal to ground. Uh, between my non-inverting input terminal and ground, I have a one volt source, positive polarity connected to the uh, non-inverting input. And so I connect my one volt source between the non-inverting input terminal and ground. So I have taken this simple schematic diagram circuit and redrawn it using the practical op amp model. So before we begin our very, very small amount of required analysis here, is everybody okay with the way that I've implemented the practical op amp model? That makes sense. All right, so we should be able to see very easily that our output voltage here should just be 10 to the five times whatever VD is, because since this is an open circuit, there can't be any current flowing through the 25 ohm resistor. Therefore, there can't be any voltage drop over the 25 ohm resistor. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? Okay. So 10 to the five times VD. Well, what is VD in this case? One, got any ideas? Jake, what about you? I'm gonna start picking on people that I didn't have for 221. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, so we want VD. So that's the voltage drop over this one mega ohm resistor, right? So if V minus is at ground and V plus is at one volt with respect to ground, VD is just one volt. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we put 10 to the five times one volt here, we get, One hundred thousand volts. This should seem suspicious, okay? Uh, because if we could simply put in a one volt DC input and get out a tenth of a million volts DC output with a little bitty chip, um, I don't know. There wouldn't be like power problems and all that kind of stuff in the world because we could just generate our own, you know, electricity. Unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. And the reason it doesn't work this way, or, or the reason, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. The reason why the model is giving us a bad answer for our output is because it is not taking into account in any way, shape or form what our power supply voltages are. In an op amp circuit, the output voltage cannot exceed the power supply voltages VCC plus and VCC minus. 
So what I mean by that is it can never be more positive than VCC plus, and it can never be more negative than VCC minus. Okay. So we can write that as a piecewise function. V out will be VCC plus when AVOL times V plus minus V minus is greater than or equal to VCC plus. It will be AVOL times V plus minus V minus when that quantity AVOL, VCC, or excuse me, uh, AVOL V plus minus V minus is between our power supply voltages. And finally, it will be VCC minus for AVOL times V plus minus V minus is less than or equal to VCC minus, okay? So I'm gonna introduce a new, uh, a new term here uh, called saturation. So we're gonna call this condition that the output is in is positive saturation. We're gonna call this guy down here at the bottom, negative saturation. And when I talk, uh, excuse me, I wanna talk about what that means very briefly, okay? So we call it saturation because a change in the input signal, which in this case is the quantity V plus minus V minus, that differential voltage does not result in a corresponding change in the output. So whenever that happens, we say that our output is saturated. So if a change in the input doesn't cause a change in the output, we have saturation. This also means that our amplifier is behaving non-linearly, okay? So this is a non-linear region of operation. And this is a non-linear region of operation because here, if the quantity VD becomes more positive, the output doesn't change. Here, if the quantity VD becomes more negative, the output doesn't change. But here in the middle, this is our linear range of operation where our amplifier is actually doing its job of creating a scaled version of our input signal. Let's call this guy in the middle, our linear region. Now, having this positive saturation region and negative saturation region isn't bad or good. It just depends on what our application is. So if we are trying to boost the level of a signal, then that's not great because we are not getting a true boost or anything. It just is a particular value when we exceed a, a certain threshold. So for an amplifier, not so great. What we're gonna talk about on Monday's class, a comparator, it's fantastic, okay? Because it's, it's very, very useful to make a binary decision of, is this signal larger or smaller than a reference? If so, give me a digital high, if not, give me a digital low. So we can use amplifiers for digital logic and all that kind of good stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? So the last thing that I wanna talk about here today is this sweet spot area and what's called the linear range of the amplifier. Now the linear range of the amplifier is very, very dependent on the voltage gain of the amplifier. 
And for an open loop amplifier, where we have a voltage gain of somewhere around 100,000 or more, we should expect to see our linear range is very, very small, like on the order of a couple of millivolts to microvolt scale. When we apply feedback, then we can expand the linear range because we have control over what the gain is. That's the whole purpose of feedback. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So our linear range uh, is simply this, okay? So our amplifier will behave linearly over the input voltage range VCC minus divided by AVOL is less than V plus minus V minus, which is less than VCC plus divided by AVOL. Our linear range is always defined with respect to our input voltages because the linear range for the output is literally from VCC minus to VCC plus by definition. So that really doesn't tell us anything at all, right? What we're interested in is what's the largest input signal we can have that still makes this amplifier behave linearly. Okay. So for our example, let me do this in blue. We'd have negative 10 volts divided by 10 to the five volts per volt is less than, let's call that input, our differential voltage VD. And then on the other side, sorry, this should be positive 10 volts, not 10 to the five. Over that same, 10 to the five volts per volt, which is simply negative 100 microvolts is less than VD is less than positive 100 microvolts. So this amplifier can only behave linearly for input signals with a magnitude of less than 100 microvolts, okay? So, not gonna get a lot of use out of this guy as an amplifier, unless we're dealing with very, very small signals. But again, we'll see on Monday that there are absolutely practical applications that utilize and exploit this very, very small linear range to do important things. All right, uh, that's enough out of me for today. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, I think I mentioned it, yeah. But your first homework assignment is up here on Moodle. I think it's only two problems. Each of the problems have multiple little parts or whatever, but it's only two problems. The online submission portal is here. The due date is December 10th, 2021, which is one week from today. It is due at 11.59 p.m., which means you have so much time to procrastinate should you choose to do so. And I'm not encouraging it by any stretch of the imagination, just letting you know your first homework assignment is not due until effectively midnight of next Friday. So you have plenty of opportunity to work on it, ask some questions and all that kind of good stuff. And if something's not clicking, by all means, come by and talk to me and we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. See you guys on uh, Monday.